Monster from the East soundtrack. Full. Huh. <laughs> Two movies to feature the beloved kaiju, Varan. Uh, I think it was only two. Yeah, he was supposed to be in GMK, but he was never in it. Blah, 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 blah. Um, now, the, the first question in which I want to ask people, and if you could leave it in the comments, that'd be just fantastic. Why do we love Varan so much? I mean, he's only been, as I said, in, in two movies. So, so why do we like him so much? Why, why is there such, like, a devout... It's almost like a religion. Of, of devout Varan followers who are like, oh, I love Varan, he's like the greatest monster ever. I never understood that, nor did I get it. Because he's only been in two movies. Is it because he was supposed to be in more films than just that? I mean, and, and is he, in two movies, right, he was in like literally about five seconds of footage in Destroy All Monsters. I mean, sure, he's got his own movie here, but why, why do we love him so much? I actually would, would absolutely love it if you guys would just leave in the comments why you love Varan so much. Because there, there is, like a, as I said, like a, an absolute devout following towards this kaiju that I never understood. And I want to understand. This, Varan has an interesting like, background in terms of its production. This is originally going to be like a, a TV production. Uh, and that was done with, I think it was like ABTV, but it turned into ABC. So basically, ABC television wanted to make a movie with Toho because they saw some of the work that Toho had done and were impressed by their use of visual effects. And so they wanted to make a, a, a two-part 4TV miniseries. Um, and this is what, it, it, what they did. This is what Toho came up with, uh, which is a very much so like a generic giant monster movie, but we'll get into that a little later. Um, and ABC Television at the last second, after Agent Super has shot all these special effects scenes, after Shiro Honda shot all this footage, after Shinichi Sekizawa penned up the script, at the last second, ABC Television, for some reason, I don't really know, maybe for financial reasons, maybe because they just weren't impressed with the footage, which I don't understand why the special effects in this movie are fucking phenomenal. But ABC Television pulled out. And so, oh my god, Toho was left with an incomplete film. They had a music score for it, they had the effects and the basic story outline. That They had that all completed. And so they're left with this, like, unfinished film, right? And, and Toho, Tomiyuki Tanaka specifically, was like, well, we have all this footage. Why don't we just make uh, a giant monster movie? I mean, they're still very popular at this time. So in comes the one and the only Shiro Honda. And Shinichi Sekizawa come in. Shinichi Sekizawa, who wrote the screenplay for this movie, thank God. You know, this movie is a very great docudrama. Uh, but it also has its light moments as well. It's, a very, it's actually, a, if you look at it, uh, one of Shinichi Sekizawa's... To me, this is an example of Shinichi Sekizawa done right. Shinichi Sekizawa's script for this is actually pretty decent. And I know in the past I've said many times that I don't. I think this movie is boring. In this recent viewing, I, I actually really enjoyed watching the film. It was actually a, a, a lot of fun to sit through. This is a great docudrama. But anyways, in comes him to pen out more scenes to kind of make this into a feature-length film. And in comes Shiro Honda to shoot more scenes. And so basically these two came together after working on the Mysterians and kind of filled in the blanks. The original television series uh, the, it has been restored and put on the DVD, uh, the, the out-of-print DVD that I do have. And first off, it's unfortunate that they couldn't restore the original aspect ratio of it, but we'll get into that a little later. Um, but what the difference is between the television version, and, which the television version with both episodes combined is a little under an hour, while the movie itself, the film version, is an hour and I want to say 28 minutes. It's almost an hour and a half. What they did was they added in a creepy introduction to Varan, the whole subplot with them, with these characters going into the mountains for the butterfly. That was all filled out a little more and fleshed out a little more. They also added in a bunch of new footage 
uh, with the battle at sea. They actually made it a battle instead of a montage as in the television version. And they also, um, the village destruction scene, because of this being padded out, is a lot later in the, tele in the, in the film version. In the television version, Varan comes out, kills those people, right? Kills those people who are looking for this butterfly and then immediately rampages through, to, uh, rampages through the town. And in comes the military and everything like that. No, in the movie, there's a much more of a buildup with Varan. You have these two people that are going to explore these butterflies and stuff like that, and they get killed mysteriously. We don't really see what killed them, but we know it's a giant monster. So in comes, you know, these scientists and stuff like that trying to figure out what's going on, and they discover Varan. And Varan destroys the, destroys the town. And then it comes to military, and the military tries to kill Varan. That fails. Varan flies away. And then the military tried to fight Varan again. That was another thing that was extended, is that uh, episode one ended where Varan flies away. And then episode two starts with a montage of the attack at sea, and then immediately jumps to the, the JSDF, the Japanese Self-Defense Forces, defending Tokyo. While in the film version, there's actually a lot of stuff going on at sea. There's, there's a lot of like efforts to try to stop Varan. And then, of course, Varan lands in Tokyo, and Varan is ultimately killed by our ingenuity. But because this film was shot for TV, TVs at the time were in a full-screen aspect ratio. So basically, like this, they were shot in a 4x3, like the original Godzilla, the original King Kong. Those are shot in 4x3. So television was like that. But movies around this time, especially in the 50s, were really, really experimenting with widescreen. Uh, you had like films like The Robe were very popular, which was the first film to be shot in Panavision, I believe. Uh, you have all these movies being shot on widescreen. Ben Hur was being made at this time. Widescreen was the thing. So was color, by the way. I mean, just a year previous, we had The Mysterians. In my opinion, the most colorful alien invasion movie ever made. Not the best, but the most colorful. They decided to go with the common ground. They're like, well, let's shoot all this additional footage in Toho Scope, we'll just shoot in black and white like Akira Kurosawa was doing on his fantastic film. Uh, what was it? Mark, what was it? What? Mark, the movie made in 1958 by Akira Kurosawa, the one you love so much. Uh, Hidden Fortress? Hidden Fortress, thank you. There, that's my roommate, everybody. Just behind the curtain. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. So they just basically took, shot it like that. Shiro Honda shot it like that. And so what they did, because he had all this footage shot in another aspect ratio, was Toho invented something called Toho Panscope. This is the only movie to ever use that logo, or to ever basically use that. And so Toho, oh my god, there's people running and screaming upstairs. All they did, basically, was lop off the top and bottom of the screen and stretch out the footage a little bit. And actually, that there, there is a notable difference in quality between the stuff shot in 4x3 and the stuff added in by Shiro Honda actual shot, actually shot in Toho Scope. Uh, and the quality is basically, the stuff shot in 4x3 is very grainy and the whites and, and blacks are more prominent. There's less gray. While if you watch this, this, the shots that were actually filmed in Toho Scope, there's a lot more gray in there. I don't really know how to describe it, but if you watch it, you will definitely no tell where they were actually shot in Toho Scope and the stuff that was shot in the regular 4x3 aspect ratio. Um, again, it's like not as grainy, not as faded, and so on and so forth. Um, and on top of that, th there is the music score by Akita of Kube, uh, who was like the king of kaiju music. I mean, whenever I think of like kaiju music scores, and I've already said this before, but I'll say it again here, I think of Akira Fukube. Akira Fukube just brought these movies to life and added another element of amazingness to them. But the music score, Honda, when they did all this stuff, Honda wanted something bigger. Uh, because there was already a soundtrack composed for the television version. Honda didn't really like that score. He thought that it needed to be a little bigger, it needed to be a little brasher, and so on and so forth. And so, because they had all this extra money that was just kind of thrown at them to, you know, complete the film and make it a feature, Honda had Akira Fukube recompose the music for the film. You can find both versions of the soundtrack online. Uh, Varan, the Monster from the East, is what the television version was called, and you can hear the soundtrack for that. And then there's, of course, Varan, the Unbelievable soundtrack. And though Akira Fukube kept a lot of the themes of the Monster from the East version, the television version, he made it bigger. And because of that, this is seriously one of Fukube's greatest scores. The music in this film is absolutely beautiful and absolutely phenomenal to, to, to just listen to. 
I do. I absolutely love the soundtrack. And a part of me thinks it's because Akira Fukube was working on so many films a year, sometimes sometimes eight films a year, he didn't have time to really do a take two on his scores. And that's why I've always found that Akira Fukube's symphony works were usually by far the superior music that he's written because he had more time to pen them out. He had more time to work on them. He had time to fix the, you know, the shortcomings of them. An example of that being Gautama the Buddha. He composed uh, music for a film in 1961 for Dai, the first movie to ever be shot in 70 millimeter film, by the way, um, in Japan. Uh, and Akira Fukube did the score for that, and he took that and made a ballet to it, and made Gautama the Buddha, which is the most beautiful piece of music that man has ever written, and one of the most beautiful pieces of music ever made, period. So this sound was made a lot bigger, you know, and the biggest example I can see of that is the opening credit music. The opening credits for the television version is very minor. Uh, I mean, it's still catchy, it still has the dun 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 you know, the, the typical Varan soundtrack that eventually turned into Rodan's theme. Uh, in both Gidra the Three-Headed Monster, Invasion of Astro Monster, and of course, sorry, I can't believe I forgot this one, uh, Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla 2 in the Heisei series. But, you know, it's bigger, he added more of a choir, uh, it just felt more fleshed out in the, in the, in the uh, film version other than the television version. So the music in this movie is amazing. Now I want to talk about Varan himself. Varan himself is cool, alright? Uh, there's nothing really special about Varan. He, he has no real special powers other than that he can become a flying squirrel. Um, and I love this design. In fact, my friend Jim, who is my new DP for Which Way They Walk, uh, was looking at the DVD title case, right, while we're getting ready to shoot. And he's like, it looks like a cross between a dragon and a flying squirrel. And I looked at it and I was like, yeah, that's a pretty good analogy. <laughs> um, and he kind of does. And, you know, normally I'd be like, this looks really stupid. You think that that kind of analogy would be really stupid? No, Varan's design is really, it was really cool. If, if you just look at it, and it moves so well, and it looks so cool. You know, and, and something that I think that makes Varan stand out from other kaijus and stuff like that are his spikes. His spikes are, are very cylindrical. <laughs> they're just cool to look at. Uh, they move really cool, and, and they make him stand out because they're almost white. Godzilla's spikes, for example, very much so blended in with the suit. Uh, they were still that kind of charcoal gray, maybe a little lighter, but they were still charcoal gray. Now, Varans uh, are very, very prominent. They're very, very white. They look cool, especially in black and white. And on top of that, like almost all Toho movies and stuff like that, though actually I think this is the one area where Dai has above... I think Dai in the height and the, the Gamera series made the more awesome roars. I think Dai had Toho beat in terms of designing monster roars. Look at Gamera's, look at, look at Jigers, look at Barragans, uh, look at Gauss. I mean, those roars are all amazing. Yeah, that was another thing with these uh, kaiju films. A lot of, you know, you know, Western movies, I mean, look at King Kong, for example, were made, in a lot of movies today, were made by meshing different roars together, like of a lion or a pig or stuff like that, and making something unique out of it. A lot of these movies in Japan, they, they did that, but a lot of them had people screaming, a lot of them had, were instruments, the original Godzillas with the fucking instruments, for example. You know, this is another reason why I think these movies, the kaiju films, stand out from the regular sci-fi films is because they use so many different things to make the roars and to make things work together. Another reason why I just love the genre in general is that reason. But anyways, Varan's roar is so cool, and I know it's kind of like Godzilla's roar, and in some cases they actually did use Godzilla's roar. But it's very cool, and it's definitely the most overused roar in kaiju history, I think. Um, because it started off with Varan's roar, then it changed to Barragan's roar, uh, and then it changed to a bunch of monsters in Ultra Q and Ultra Man and Ultra 7, and then it was used for Gorosaurus. Yeah, it's very overused, that roar. Um, <laughs> I mean, you just hear it everywhere. Now, now kind of speaking of Iran, it would, be, it would be a sin for me not to talk about this. The audio commentary on this DVD uh, was, was done by uh, Keizio Maruse, who worked in the art department at this time. This is his first motion picture he worked on. And may I just say, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, that this is one of the greatest audio commentaries I've ever heard for anything because of the story that is told behind the scenes of everything that happened with all these Toho Tokusatsu films. His story is, is so inspiring and, and, and so insightful. It literally made me want to go out and make a movie. It wanted me to just shoot something. No script, no nothing, just shoot something. 
the honor commentary is just full of, of memories, and he remembers Varan quite well. He, he loves this movie. I mean, it was his first movie, of course. It's like his child. Your first movie, you're always going to remember. My first feature film was Guy Love the Invincible, a stop-motion monster destroying Osaka. And it was me and my friend Ryan Marvin running around with Tommy guns. The movie's never going to see the light of day, don't ask. I still remember making that movie uh, vividly because it was my first attempt to film something. It was my first attempt to actually put something in cult mine. And so, of course, he has natural memories about this. He was the person who actually designed Varan. He was the person that gave us all these designs, and he worked with Toho right through Godzilla vs. the Sea Monster. You know, he helped design Mothra, he designed Magma from Gorath, he designed, he helped design freaking King Ghidorah. I mean, he, he was really responsible for making all these kaiju designs that we know and love today. So here's a man who's just talking his, his heart out in this movie, and you can hear his enthusiasm on the audio commentary. It's a, a fantastic audio commentary. Um, but even his story is just great because he's, he talked about like how he was only making like 150 yen a week, which couldn't even afford him three bowls of noodles, and, and like how he was starving on the streets and how he rose in the art department. First off, the art department when he came in only had five people, and they were making like sometimes three to four films a year. Only five people working on that, but wow, that's just fucking crazy. That's unheard of today. Now you'd have unions up the yin yang screaming at you to do less work. And these guys were all working their butts off because they wanted to work. These guys were the true epitome of creativity. These people were where you, if you want to see creativity, it's with these people. It's with these, like, listen to these stories. These people were the people who went out there and saw things and were like, oh, that's cool. Oh, that's cool. And because of them, we have all this stuff that we have today. So we had to thank them just, just immensely in the, in the film world. Sorry, that was a rant. Seriously, if you can get your hands on this out-of-print DVD, listen to that audio commentary. I know it's in Japanese and you have to watch it with subtitles, but it is so insightful and so wonderfully done. And the memories that he talks about of, you know, riding a bicycle with Eiji Tsuburaya, how he looked at Eiji Tsuburaya like he was a god and everything like that. It's a great story, great, great story. It's interesting to note that they actually made, another thing that makes Varan kind of stand out is the skin texture is so different. They're not scales, they're like bumps. And they actually made these rigid bumps by, you know, pouring a mold, right? Pouring a mold into like a bathtub. And so then when everything kind of puffed up, they put peanut shells all over it. And that's how they made Varan's skin texture. I'm like, oh, that's so cool. That's, that's so fucking cool. Varan looks utterly amazing with this widescreen aspect ratio. I know he was shot in full screen, but with the cropping, he fits the entire frame. He's like King Ghidorah. I couldn't imagine seeing King Ghidorah in full screen and Ghidra the Three-Headed Monster. I don't know how I survived with that VHS tape. Uh, because King Ghidorah literally fills the entire screen, and you see the massiveness of his body. Varan is the same way. His tail is so long, his body is so massive, that he just fits the frame, and it works so well in the widescreen aspect ratio. The one complaint I have with Varan is that I could do without him flying. <laughs> I could do without him flying. It looks so terrible. It looks, it looks so awful. That was the one decision in the American cut of the film that I agreed with, is that they cut out the scenes of Varan flying. Because it looks utterly ridiculous. How can Varan, like first off, the scenes where he's walking around and stuff, you don't see that webbing. And suddenly his webbing is there, and he just like jumps, and all of a sudden, look, he's flying like a bird. It looks ridiculous. And actually very, very laughable. But the, the American version was released in 1961. They basically Godzilla King of the Monsters it. And they shot a bunch of footage with an American actor and then inserted it into the film. And it's awful. It's, I don't even know why they call it um, Varan the Unbelievable because freaking they don't even call him Varan in the movie. They call him like Obachi or something like that. It's fucking ridiculous. And it's a stupid movie. They cut out Akira Fukube's music score and replaced it with the stock music crap. And they cut out Varan's roar, so I'm like, oh my god, there's two out of three things, and I'm like, oh, this is really good, and then it's gone. It's just an awful movie, and it's just barely over an hour. They cut so much out of it and just rearranged the plot. It's just awful. Oh my god. Ugh. Oh my god, I can't do it with the mask. The overall plot is very generic. Um, you know, it, it reminds me of, like, the old Ray Harryhausen films. You know, like, it came from beneath the sea, 20 million miles to Earth, even though 20 million miles to Earth is an amazing film. But it reminds me of those films because of how simple the plot is and how it's just about the monster. Uh, which isn't an insult, don't get me wrong, that, that isn't an insult. 
towards the film, really. I just wanted to state that. Um, and it, it, there are a lot of films out there that are about giant monsters or something like this that have kind of the same basic plot structure as this film. So the, the, the plot in this film isn't really anything overly great. Um, nor was it really meant to be. This is what I'd like to call a mockudrama or a docudrama. And you know how much I love those. I, I praised I praised films like The Andromeda Strain, directed by Robert Wise, and as well as films such as The Longest Day. Those are like docudramas uh, to the T. And this is kind of a docu a docu mockudrama. Uh, and I just want to say, overall with the film, I find the second half of the movie where the military attacks Rams for the first time to when he lands in Tokyo to be the better part of the film. Uh, the much more enjoyable part of the film because it's literally nothing but action. I mean, there, there is rarely a moment in the second, the second half of this film where there isn't something happening or something, or something to do with the monster. And I like that. Um, well, the first half, it, it's actually kind of slow. The first half is, it's, it's got a good build up to Varan, don't get me wrong, but it's just generic. And so you already know, oh, you're, and the monster's gonna come out, oh, look at that, oh, look, there's the inciting moment, oh. It's very generic, so you already know what's gonna happen, but when all of a sudden the monster attacks the town and then the military comes in, it's just shit happening one after the other. I love it. <laughs> I do. Um, I, I do, I, I fucking love how, how fast-paced it kind of gets after that. I mean, there's a lot of shit that happens. You know, the, and the Japanese army does a lot to fucking try to stop Varan. I mean, they try gassing him to death, they try blowing him up, they, they do a lot, and they throw, like, everything they've got into this monster to try to stop him, and I'm like, oh, that's so cool. <laughs> uh, and I love the montage stuff that goes on with, like, the stuff out at sea, and so on and so forth, of them death charging him and them trying to kill him with the jets. Uh, great wire work, by the way, and I love that. I love that kind of stuff. I love that. You don't need characters, just, just show it moving as it would progress in actual reality. Um, you just have like all this techno babble going on or having these people talk about the military strategy That's the so entire second half of the film and I love that shit. So I, I kind of dug it <laughs> um, at The very beginning of the movie it kind of it kind of opens like uh, uh, it opens actually Identically to fucking space amoeba <laughs> um, Except less impressive <laughs> this movie opens with a rocket being shot into space and the narrator saying we don't even know the mysteries of Earth, blah, 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 so why are we going into space, blah, 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 and I could have done without that. I'm like, can you just go into the movie, please? I could have done without the narrator as well. There's a narrator that pops up three times in a film. Once at the very beginning of the movie when the rocket's taken off, once when Varan takes off, and then finally at the very end of the film, uh, which I could have done completely without the narrator and the story would have been the same, or the overall feeling and tone of the movie would have been the same. Another complaint that I have with this film is that there is zero explanation as to why Varan is alive, or why he picked now, of all time, to come back and kill everyone. <laughs> it really could have been just a generic thing, could have done with global warming. I, I would have even bought atomic nuclear testing brought him back to life, even though that would make no sense. But it would have been an explanation. You could have done a lot with this. The reason why he's angry is because he's the last of his kind. You know, I think that would have been a great anger, uh, a great anger, a great angle to go on with Varan's character and would have made him again um, something like a normal Toho movie. Like Rodan, for example, the, the previous kaiju film that, you know, the, the group of Shiro Honda, that Shiro Honda made. Uh, it would have been great to have something along those lines of giving Varan some sort of a character. The only character that Varan gets and this is that he's mad <laughs> uh, and destroys shit. That's it. You know, he's very much so a very, gen very, very generic monster. Like it came from beneath the sea. Where that the the, the sextopus, because it only has six tentacles, not eight. There's no reason why the octopus is attacking. It's just attacking. I wish they gave some sort of a reason as to why, and I wish they made, gave Varan a, a, some sort of a character. Because at this point. Varan is just a giant monster, a stereotypical giant monster. You know, it, it, even in the original Godzilla and Rodan, you know, they had tragic aspects about them. Here, it's not really the case. There isn't really anything out of the ordinary that really brings Varan out, uh, that really makes him unique, other than his design. And another thing that I have to ask is, why does Varan, there, there's a scene, right, where, where the military attack Varan for the first time and they're like, ah, shit, we don't, in typical giant monster faction, they're like, we can't kill him with regular conventional weapons. And so Varan chases them, right, 
And so Varan chases the two leading actors into a cave. Why does he chase them into a cave other than to add basically a, a fake, uh, fake tension? And you know how much I hate fake tension by my review for King Kong Escapes. That added fake tension and there was no need for it. However, it does introduce the fact that Varan is attracted to flares, something again that they stole from Godzilla. <laughs> Well, actually, not Godzilla, but Godzilla raids again. So they stole it from Godzilla, you know what I mean. Um, but but it, it is said by the natives that he's very angry at human beings. It, there's, it's never explained why, but he's very angry at human beings and that he goes up. Why would it make... Why would Varan be chasing these two people when all this military commotion is going on just a couple miles down the road? It, it makes no sense, okay? I hate artificial tension. Um, However, that being said, with the battle scenes, the battle scenes are really well done, <laughs> and I mean that. The destruction of the village uh, shows the suit off very well. It, sh it basically shows us the might of Varan, uh, and the suit, again, looks great in the widescreen aspect ratio, and the miniatures look absolutely fantastic. Um, I, I think a lot of it has to do, and first off, it's shot in the day, but I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that this film, despite being shot after the Mysterians, was shot in black and white. And I think that hide a lot of hid a lot of the, the, the clunkiness with, with the sets and with the suits and so on and so forth. Um, and also the, the, the cinematography is great, uh, but we'll get into that a little later. Um, but the village destruction scene was very well done. Um, the music helped a lot. I love Varan's theme. And there's also a lot of tension uh, during the, the army attack at, at, in the lake. There is, because you don't know what Varan is going to do. You, you don't know, when, when the army is retreating, you actually feel like they have to get out of there, right? You actually feel the buildup, because it would cut to, like, a guy's running for life, cut back to Varan walking out of the lake. Cut to the army guys running away, cut to Varan now trying to get them. You know, it was very much so a... I'm only saying this because I'm watching it right now, but it kind of reminded me of that. It reminded me of War of the Worlds, the 1953 film. It added genuine tension there, and I, and I applaud the filmmakers for that. During the, the, the first attack uh, at the lake, there are scenes where they drop like these poison, uh, these poison shells into the lake, and it basically kills the, everything in the lake, and it forces Varan to come out. It's a terrible effect. It's clear, it looks like it was just shot in like a generic fish tank, and they just dropped something in like that, and there was like a paper cardboard backdrop in the background. It looks terrible. <laughs> in fact, all the shots that take place underwater in this film look pretty bad. Like, there's one where, like, a ship is going over and Varan is, like, hiding under a rock and stuff like that. It looks it looks terrible during the attack at sea. It looks awful. You can see images of it on Google, and it just... Because everything else with the movie is really good, right? And all the effects are really outstanding. And then all of a sudden there's that, you know? It's just... There's something so good here, right? There's something really good. It's like... It's like you're watching Citizen Kane, and throughout Citizen Kane, it's intercut with Plan 9 from Outer Space. I mean, sure, it's not, it's nowhere near as dramatic as that, but that's kind of the feeling that it gets, and it makes it stand out, like, really bad. The sea battles are very, very energetic. There's, and it helps, Akira Fukube's music helps a lot, and the way how it's edited is great, but you have a lot of mixture, of great mixture of actual stock footage of the Navy doing shit, and uh, miniature ships firing, and Varan himself getting hit and shot at. There's lots of energy. Normally in shot and stuff like that, I mean, this kind of had a problem in the Mysterians where shots kind of linger a little too long. No, that wasn't the case here. It was very well paced and very well put together. Um, and then, of course, the, fi the final attack was full of stock footage from Godzilla and Godzilla Raids again. It's very blatant. Uh, if you've seen the movies enough like I have, you can definitely tell which shots are stock footage. But yeah, it's also intercut with a lot of new stuff. Uh, so I guess that's all right. I mean, it kind of does stick out and stuff like that. But it's still done pretty well overall. Um, my only complaint is that Varan doesn't really do much. Um, he just basically lands by this airport, destroys the airport tower, and then is killed. Uh, that is really it. He's, he's killed by, um, you know, there is this dynamite, right, that's like 20 times more powerful than an actual regular stick of dynamite. And they're like, let's use it on Varan. And so they use it on Varan uh, one time, thinking it's going to kill him. It explodes under his private parts and, you know, basically just gives Varan blue balls. First off, that explosion was real. It actually went off, uh, uh, Haru Nakajima played Varan in this film. It actually went off underneath his nuts and got, he got burned really bad and hurt really bad. And so when you see Varan fall over and just stumble, that was actually Haru Nakajima in immense pain. <laughs> so my tip, my hat to you, good sir. 
Um, even though he's never gonna watch this. <laughs> And he doesn't even speak English, so why the fuck? So actually, it's a cool idea. I, mean, I, I do like this. Some of Honda comes out here where he's like, the power of human ingenuity. Um, it, it's in a lot of a Shiro Honda film, especially in ones kind of a light-hearted nature like this, where it's not too dark, but yet it's not too light. On this, um, Shiro Honda, or they have the idea that they basically make Varan eat the flare and have it blow up within him, which is gruesome as all hell. And so it works, and that's how they kill Varan. <laughs> I have to say this. The, the head scientist, he's like an old windbag who has a terrible comb-over in this film. He's played by Correa Senda. I hate him. He is like my least favorite actor ever. Like, worse than Tommy Wiseau. Because at least Tommy Wiseau, so it, it, I laugh at. Correa Senda has no fucking emotions in his voice at all. It, it's, so, it's so bland. And he's also in Battle in Outer Space. And he's a big pro. I have a big problem with him there too. He's he's just a bad actor, and he sticks out from everyone else because it looks like he doesn't give a shit. And I don't know if that's just because of him or if that's why how Shiro Honda directed him, but he does the same thing in Battle in Outer Space, so I think it's more him than anything else. But his backstory is sad. Uh, not not his character, but Korea Senda's backstory is sad. His whole backstory of how he was beat up a lot when he was a kid because he was half Korean, and the Japanese and Koreans never had a great relationship. Um, he was picked on a lot, and he was abused a lot, blah, 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 blah. His, his story is actually very sad. You learned a bit about his backstory in the audio commentary on the DVD for Battle in Outer Space. But it is interesting to note that the leads in this film are not played by Honda's normal crew, like Kenji Zahara, Akihiko Harada, and all them sort of people. Uh, they're not really present here, and I think that's because these were second-rate actors. And I don't mean that in a negative is. I, I, I'm saying that, uh, as in this was a, a lower-budget movie, and so they, they grabbed second-rate actors, or up-and-coming actors, and that's why we don't see the normal crew. We do have some, some cameos of, these, of, his, of Honda's normal crew. Takarada is the, the guy who makes the dynamite that blows up. Um, uh, Suchio Tsuchiya, uh, who plays Shindo, Mr. Shindo, um, he plays an army officer in this film. Um, and the guy who plays Kumayama from Mothra vs. Godzilla, the, the evil guy <laughs> who blows the smoke in the picture and says that picture ought to be excellent, um, he plays a fleet captain in this film. You, you know, you have a bunch of stuff like that. However, the lead actor in this film, I don't know what his name is, his name is Kenji in the film, but the actor's name has escaped me at this point. He's a generic scientist uh, who uh, forms a friendship with the, the leading actress, who is a photographer. So, of course, it's kind of like a generic romance. But what makes this kind of stand up is that they don't... Like, an American film would have harpered on this romance, right? Here, it's not really a love story. It's more of a friendship that forms between the two. And it's played decently well. It's played decently well off. Um, like, like, during the attack, when, when the military retreats from the lake, uh, she gets stuck underneath a tree. And, and uh, Kenji runs back to the army base, the makeshift army base, and is like, has she come back? And they're like, no. He immediately goes running back in the woods, and he looks genuinely worried, so at least it's well played, you know? It, it is a friendship. Um, and she's not a ditz, or she's not a damsel in distress, because during the final attack of the scene, Kenji, uh, when Varan is dying, they run towards the shore. All the characters are running towards the shore, and there's this great tracking shot where... Uh, you see Kenji and, and this photographer running next to each other. He's like, Shinji, stay back. It's going to be dangerous. And she's like, and because she's a photographer, she's like, and miss an opportunity like this? I don't think so. <laughs> you know, it, she's not the strongest female character at all. She has little to no character at all. But at least she's not a typical damsel in distress that would be in like a Hollywood science fiction movie at this time. You know, this is another reason why I love Shiro Honda. Shiro Honda often gave his female characters an actual character or actual, you know, backbone. He's kind of an asshole as well, Kenji. He's kind of an asshole because when they arrive after the, you know, the two scientists before that get killed at the beginning of the movie and set forth everything else with the film, he arrives and just shits all over the natives' beliefs in Baradagi, which is their name for Varan, which they think he's a god. He just shits all over him. He's like, you guys are stupid. Why the fuck would you believe in this horseshit? And he's also the reason why the town gets fucking destroyed, because he convinces them all, way too quickly for my liking, by the way, to go and search for... What happens is that, like, this boy escapes, right, and is, runs off to the lake, and they're like, oh, no. And so he convinces them all to go after him, while the priest is like, no, you can't do that, because you'll anger Baradagi. Sure enough, Varan comes out and fucking destroys everything. He's the reason why it fucking happens, so you're kind of a dick. 
It's good going. Um, you're the reason why Varan is evil. Everyone else in the film is just there to progress the plot, and that's it. Um, <laughs> which is fine for me, because this is very much so like a docudrama. <laughs> um, you know, it, 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 made, it, it makes it a fun docudrama. Um, because the movie itself, especially when Varan and the army start dealing with each other, it moves very well, it's very quick, and so on and so forth, and I've already, I've already said that. <laughs> um, uh, and, you know, the, as I've already stated, the military stuff is utterly amazing. You didn't need any three-dimensional characters after that, because it's all about we've got to kill Varan, and I like that stuff. I like the techno, I like the techno babble that goes on. I like the, the whole strategy that, that's formed to, to, to how do we kill Varan. I say I love that stuff, so I, 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 I dug into it. This film also has, like, phenomenal cinematography, and I, I genuinely mean that. The cinematography for this film is phenomenal. Though the, sh the, the camera itself does the typical Honda push-in, pull-out, and stuff like that, uh, though the camera is often very still in this film, there's stuff moving around in the shots, especially during the second half of the film. There's always stuff happening on screen that keeps your eye glued to the screen. I try to do that in my films, and which way they walk, the shots are very still a lot. And so what I wanted was I want like somebody moving in the background, some smoke in the, in the foreground, and so on and so forth. Just things to keep the screen moving without actually moving the camera. Uh, and art that's lost in today's cinema. <laughs> cough, cough, Peter Jackson. Uh, I'm just kidding, Peter Jackson, I love you. He, it, that, it's that kind of stuff that makes the cinematography in this film very, very interesting. And a lot of that has to do with, you know, the scenes where they're discussing the plan to kill Varan or the plan to, you know, keep him away from Tokyo. There's always shit moving around when it's just characters sitting down and talking. There's always army guys moving around in the background. It keeps your eyes glued to the screen, and that's, that's good cinematography. So, like, in the end, this isn't, this isn't exactly an original movie. It's very generic. Um, but it, at the same time, it's a lot of fun. It's a, it's a fun docudrama. Um, and I, I do recommend it. Um, if you want to know the standard, typical 50s science fiction monster movie, this is one of the better movies you could go to. Um, this, it, it is a lot of fun. Uh, great visual effects, uh, some decent acting, except for Korea Senda. Um, you know, a phenomenal music score, great cinematography. You know, it, it, it's a fun film. And I was going to give this film two and a half out of four stars, but this viewing I enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I was going to. So I'm going to give this film three out of four. Um, nothing to be ashamed of there. Uh, it is a fun movie, and do check it out. <laughs> um, especially if you're an Ashiro Honda enthusiast. Uh, so, go on Facebook. Uh, like my new movie, Which Way They Walk. More stuff is to come out soon. Uh, like Ann Productions on Facebook. Uh, like the Godzilla Saga on Facebook. And if you wish, join my new group uh, called Geeks for Geeks, where you can be who you were born to be. <laughs> um, just We welcome all fandoms, all sorts of discussions. And also, it's a place where you can promote yourself to other geeks. If you have a video or a product to, to promote, that would be a place to do it. It's a great place for networking. We have some of the craziest conversations ever on that group. It's fantastic. Um, but yeah, so subscribe. Hit the subscribe button. Like it up. Leave a comment telling me about your thoughts of this film. I love discussions. Uh, and this is Adam Noyce from Adam Noyce saying, sayonara.